Should I get to mine? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, we need unions to help us. Uh, we and do. It's the only way out. Mm -hmm. Really, it's the only way out. And that's what my segment is about. So it's been kind of a whirlwind beginning for the fledgling Biden administration. Left-wing critics like ourselves have pointed out that just in the first month of the administration, the Democrats have backed off the $2,000 check in favor of $1,400 checks which still haven't arrived, by the way. They've backed off the $15 minimum wage, citing the Senate parliamentarian's objection, and they dropped a new type of facility for detained migrant children. They bombed Syria again. By the way, what does the parliamentarian think about that? But there is one piece of legislation that has not dominated the discourse, but it quietly passed in the House on February 4th and would now have to pass through the Senate. If passed, it would be one of the most consequential pieces of legislation in American history. It would transform the way workers in this country can organize themselves into labor unions. It's called the PRO Act, and Biden has indicated that if it does pass the Senate, he will sign it. Now, here's the part of the segment where I typically would include some sort of generic news clip that would help intro the main topic. But as I was researching the PRO Act, I found that there was basically no coverage of it on cable news outside of OAN. But I did find this father and son duo who have a YouTube channel called the Matterhorn, Matterhorn Business Development. So let's have them intro the PRO Act. It's called the Federal PRO Act or the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. Mm -hmm. So these acts and these laws have very good titles. If you just looked at it on a voting ballot oh, and you yeah. had no idea what it was. Everybody should have the right to organize. We should all protect the right to organize. Well, that's right. <laughs> now, as far as I can tell, this father-son duo, they're consultants that help small businesses focus on something called profit first. So let's see what they think about what the PRO Act actually is. Okay, so let's get right down to the okay. bottom line. So, what is this thing? If we just cut right to the heart of it. So in the Washington Post article that I found, it basically sums up the PRO Act as would amend some of the country's decades old labor. So obviously, obviously it's outdated. That's outdated. Yep. Yep. Uh, give workers more power doing, during disputes at work. Add penalties for companies that retaliate against workers who organize and grant some hundreds of thousands of workers collective bargaining rights they don't currently have. Now, now all of that sounds good. Yeah, all that sounds good. I can't see why these guys would object to any of that. But there's a reason why these business nerds are so hostile to it. The PRO Act would be the most comprehensive piece of labor legislation in about 90 years. Jacobin's Alex Press spoke to Brandon Magner, a labor attorney who has written extensively about the PRO Act, and he said, the PRO Act is the first act where they're going to, they're going from point A to point Z through everything that's been, that's been seen to be wrong with labor law since Taft-Hartley at least. In fact, it even goes to the original Wagner Act. For example, they get rid of employer standing and representation hearings, which a lot of people have criticized from the beginning, but no law has tried to get rid of until now. That's important because while you've had things like EFCA, which is the Obama era reform, which was attempted and, and shelved, which tried to make it easier to form a union and to get a first contract, then you had things like the permanent striker replacement bill, which would have made it easier for already unionized companies to get a successor contract because the right to strike would have been a lot stronger at that point. I haven't seen a bill that combines the idea of needing to form unions and needing to be able to bargain and effectively wield the strike weapon to get later contracts. The PRO Act also tries to bring in more employees under its ju jurisdiction. So it's trying to make the NLRA apply to more sectors of the workforce. So when I say it's comprehensive, I mean it. They're looking at all of the angles of how labor law enforcement can be strengthened in this country. So this would amount to a total overhaul of labor law in America. The possibilities for labor, should this pass, are almost unimaginable. Because in America right now, the law is stacked against labor in a way that is totally unique in the developed world. Now, America's history with labor is an interesting one. It is both one of the birthplaces of the modern labor movement, but it is also the country with perhaps the most violent suppression of labor activity. In fact, May Day, which you all know is celebrated around the world, came from the Haymarket Affair in 1886, in which workers in Chicago went on strike for an eight-hour day and were then murdered and their leaders hanged. 
But by the 1930s, the power of labor could not be suppressed any longer. And in the midst of the Great Depression, American workers organized with a degree of militancy that we have not seen since. In 1937, during the depths of the Great Depression, there were over 4,740 strikes in a single year, the greatest strike wave in American labor history. To put that in context, there were only seven major work stoppages in 2020. And the law at the time reflected labor's militancy and power. I mean, in, 1980, in 1935, FDR signed the National Labor Relations Act, better known as the Wagner Act, into law. It was the first time that the law guaranteed private sector workers the right to organize unions and bargain collectively. The result was a flurry of labor activity. According to a piece uh, in Jacobin by Colin Gordon, between 1935 and 1945, bolstered by new legal protections and a tight wartime labor market, union membership skyrocketed from 3.7 million, or just over 10% of the labor force, to almost 15 million, over a third of the labor force in just a decade. Now, this freaked business out, to say the least. I mean, the landscape for the American worker was transformed overnight. The power of labor during this period of American history is the main reason why when you think of the 1930s, you think of impoverished masses and super lines. But when you think of the 1950s, you think of a nuclear family with a nice little house in the suburbs and the white picket fence. But this labor militancy could not be tolerated by capital for long. And they worked furiously to undermine the Wagner Act almost as soon as it was signed into law. The result was something called the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947, just 12 years after the passage of the Wagner Act in 1935. Here's Richard Wolff explaining just what Taft-Hartley did. It had a remarkable clause, which has remained law to this day as I'm speaking. And the clause goes like this. If at a workplace, a factory, an office, a store... There's a union, and let's say half the workers in this place have voted for the union and joined the union and have a union there. And let's say that that union negotiates with the employer and gets a contract, let's say a wage increase of 10 cents an hour. Under the Taft-Hartley law, then and to this moment, that union must, must give anything it wins with the employer to all the workers there, whether they're in the union or not, whether they join the union or not, whether they pay union dues or not, whether when the union, if it thought it had to, called a strike and had workers go out and tell the public about their situation to help pressure the employer to meet them halfway and give them a wage increase. The workers who went on strike and therefore didn't get paid had to give to all the other workers who didn't go on strike, who didn't lose a day's pay, the same benefits they won. The Taft-Hartley law, in effect, created an incentive for workers not to join a union, not to pay the union dues, because they would get whatever the union won, whether they did so or not. That's fundamentally unfair, and you know it, and I know it, and the people then knew it. It was a hammer blow against the labor movement. It was a hammer blow against the labor, labor movement. You know it, and I know it, and they all knew it at the time. They also, by the way, outlawed communists from being in the labor leadership, which they had been up until then. And it basically created a structure in which the labor movement was always going to eventually bleed out. And here's how Jane McAlevey, uh, here's how Jane McAlevey talks about Taft Harley and how it wound up destroying labor solidarity in this country. She writes, the quote, the ban on sympathy strikes and boycotts meant that truck drivers could no longer refuse to deliver goods to a factory where the workers were on strike. Food service workers would have to break through a picket line to prepare food for replacement workers or risk being fired if they didn't. That didn't just weaken strikes in obvious ways. There was a more nefarious psychological objective aimed at undermining human solidarity, which is an instinct that emerges when one group of people sees another in a profound, in profound duress or under attack, as in a hurricane or a flood. Strikes build the same kind of bonds that events like natural disasters produce. Banning sympathy for the idea of the collective good was part of a broader long-term effort to rewire humans from acting collectively to acting individually. In think tanks such as the Mont Pelerin Society, discussions were underway about the need to re-socialize worker behavior to better fit conservative economists' views that people should act only out of self-interest. 
But forcing workers into re-education camps was too blunt an instrument in the United States. It was more acceptable to so slowly stoke individualism by making the default acts of human sympathy illegal and so punishable by termination. So back to the PRO Act. Essentially what the PRO Act would do is reverse the, reverse the nefarious legacy of Taft-Hartley and go beyond it in many ways. But the question is, will the Democrats actually pass it? Well, if the last 40 years are any indication, the prospects aren't great. Here's Alexander Herzl Fernandez, a researcher for the Department of Labor on the Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It's just so striking to look at how conservatives and Republicans versus Democrats have treated labor unions over the decades. While conservatives were hard at work pushing Republican lawmakers to vote for cutbacks to labor union rights, Democrats were generally on the sidelines. Um, if you look at uh, state level control, you know, Republicans, as soon as they gain trifecta control of a state government, they push for cuts to collective bargaining for public sector labor unions and right to work laws. But Democrats don't have a similar portfolio of policies that they push when they gain power across the states. There's no democratic equivalent of, say, a right to work law. And that's similarly true at the national level. During the last period when Democrats controlled uh, Congress and the White House under the Obama administration, uh, the Obama administration notably let labor reform sort of fall by the wayside. There wasn't a concerted push to rebuild build that power at the federal level either. Well, the good news is that some in the later labor leadership seem to have learned their lesson. The PRO Act was really created and pushed by a union called the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. They've led the charge from the very beginning. And in an interview with Jacobin, the vice president of the Painters Union, Jim Williams, discussed Barack Obama's betrayal of labor in 2009 when he promised to pass car check and then didn't. Williams said, we also have a pretty good memory. In 2008, when, this, when then Senator Obama, who pledged to support of the Employee Free Choice Act, EFCA, which also is known as Card Check, became president, he had large, larger majorities in both the House and the Senate. We had the opportunity then to pass the EFCA, but it wasn't the priority of the administration. When we met with candidates during the last election cycle, we made sure that the PRO Act was number one on our issues. And we said, if it's not in your top priorities, we'll make sure to never support you again it's that important to us. We knew that there's going to be a lot of competing interests for legislative priorities going into a new Biden administration and going into a time period where we have slim majorities, but majorities nonetheless in both House and the Senate. So we have to hold the politicians accountable that we supported. So we wanted to get out early and get out in front because far too often labor law reform is not a public debate. Too often it's done with politicians inside Washington, D.C., in private. But we feel that the current, with the current majorities, we're at least going to get labor law reform and the PRO Act in the public sphere. The debate can be public. For us, that's a win to be able to once and for all talk about the broken labor laws in this country and build a movement that includes people beyond the labor movement to fight for real change in this country. We think it's the most important piece that labor unions can be doing at this time. Well, what about Uncle Joe himself? Well, here's what he said on the campaign trail. Wall Street didn't build this country. Ordinary middle-class Americans given half a chance to build it. And the only reason we have a middle class is unions, not labor, unions, organized labor, unions. You're the reason why we're going to rebuild the middle class. It's been decimated by these policies. You all know it. As your president, I promise you, I will stand with you. You look at my record, I've always stood with you and never been afraid to take on the opposition, the corporations and the big money. And, you know, my dad used to have an expression. He said, Joey, a job is about a lot more than a paycheck, about your dignity. It's about respect. There will be no trade agreement in my administration without organized labor sitting at the table. God love you. I need you. Look me over. I promise you, you'll never have a better friend in the White House. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Well, Joey had a good opportunity to follow up on that kind of rhetoric rhetoric when thousands of workers in an Amazon warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama, decided to organize a union. That fight is ongoing. They are sending their ballots in right now through March 29th. An assist from the most powerful person on the planet would do a lot to give those workers the belief and confidence to press on in their fight against Amazon. In fact, many of the tactics that Amazon has engaged in to combat the unionization, unionization effort would be illegal under the PRO Act. I mean, some of the tactics that they've engaged in are already illegal under current law, but that's 
a different story. Well, Joe Biden has been absolutely silent on the fight in Bessemer. According to Politico, when Joe Biden was running for president, he promised union members that he would be the best friend labor has ever had in the White House. Now in office, Biden is keeping his distance from the biggest union fight of his early presidency, one involving a powerful company that gave to his inauguration and his pledge to help his administration fight the COVID-19 pandemic. The White House on Wednesday declined to directly endorse the union election at the e-commerce giant Amazon Alabama's warehouse. So as ever, we can't rely on these Democrats alone. If the PRO Act is going to pass, it's going to require sustained pressure from below and militancy from organized labor. And make no mistake of it, there is no left or progress without organized labor. It's never happened before. And in all likelihood, it will not happen again. The PRO Act would go a long way to revitalizing the labor movement in this country. At one point, labor in America really did change the world and it could do so again. But more important than that, can we just pass the PRO Act to own these dweebs? Yeah. And we've said this numerous times and I still get a bazillion comments, okay? Um, we aren't Republican, Democrat, or anything else in between. We look at information from a unopposed view and an unbiased view to look at what helps people and what doesn't help people. Mm -hmm. I am also not pro Uber and Lyft. Every time you leave me a comment that says, oh, well, I did this thing and Uber took 90% of my money. I'm like, okay, I think that's bad, <laughs> okay? I agree with you, that's stupid, right. okay? But I'm not saying that because Uber took 90% of your fare, I should lose my two sources of income. Right. Because that's actually how I do a lot of my work mm -hmm. is on an independent contracting basis, mm -hmm. right? So it actually ruins other people's lives because you got ripped off by Uber. Guess what? I know you don't want to hear it, but if Uber ripped you off, don't drive for them again. Right. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that all of you watching right now go to the Matterhorn Business Development YouTube channel and make fun of them in their comments. But if you wanted to do that, you can go ahead. It's your choice because we simply cannot, under any circumstances, let them win. That was so good. Um, what is it with uh, business-minded people and awful button-down shirts, like just the oh. worst and loudest button-down shirts. Um, well, they all buy their, I, they all buy their shirts, shirts from Wyatt Coke, uh, the <laughs> Coke, uh, like the, like the Coke air that started, started his own shirt company. Yeah. That's, so that's right. right. That's right. I yeah. forgot about that guy. Um, you know, it's interesting because the Taft Hartley act, um, obviously had the objective of dividing and conquering among workers. And, you know, it certainly succeeded. Um, and obviously uh, created a disincentive for people to join unions. Uh, and what we're kind of seeing play out right now in the political discourse is a little more of that same, for lack of a better word, like trend or culture, right? Like finding ways to emphasize the quote unquote differences that Americans have, uh, whether it's based on gender or, you know, nationality, race, whatever it is, just find ways to create these small pockets of movements that are not going to have uh, the organized effort necessary to actually fight for a better country, like fight for better, you know, policies, even if it has to do with, um, you know, equality laws in the workplace, right? You need like a broad coalition, you need labor, you need people to be willing to work with others that they might have some disagreements with on, you know, cultural or social issues in order to create an equitable system for workers in this country. And uh, what we hear from both parties is just this emphasis on everything that makes us different from one another, right? Yeah. It disempowers us. Yeah. Well, beyond that, it's just the only way to really flex muscle, to really That's flex right. any sort of power is is through a labor union. Really, we can, we can shout on YouTube all day and maybe it has a little effect and stuff like that. But, you know, until people kind of get organized around labor unions, Nothing will really change. I mean, I, I, I think about the the George Floyd protests um, last summer, which seemed like forever ago. What do we got to show for it? I mean, the, some of the largest mass demonstrations in American history. What do we got to show for it? Very, very little. Almost nothing, really. Because without connecting those to actual labor power, nothing will change. 
it's just nothing will change. Like, yes, there is there is something nice about like all of us sharing in in some sort of public display and all that stuff, but nothing changed. Same with the Iraq war protests, massive protests all over the world. Did it stop the Iraq war? No, it did not stop the Iraq war. You know, so unless you have labor power behind you, you're not going to change anything. That's how civil rights was achieved. It was the combination of the civil rights activists with labor power. They worked hand in glove to pass civil rights. And what's remarkable to me is, I mean, I, I really, when I was watch, researching this uh, this segment, I was expecting, you know, maybe Chris Hayes did a segment on, on the PRO Act, uh, you know, on MSNBC, something on... You know, I found one little measly segment on CNBC where they had like a 30 second interview with Richard Trumka, the the, the head of the AFL CIO, um, and then a bunch of segments on OAN, like the crazy right wing network, and then a bunch of segments from like Dan Crenshaw walking and talking and is like in the hallway of Congress with his eye patch saying like the Pro Act, that's real bad. You don't want that because you know right to work. Does who cares? Who doesn't think about right to work? So. Yeah, just zero coverage from the media um, on television for the PRO Act. And, you know, that's just, again, it's just an indictment about of, of our entire media culture that doesn't cover any substantive issues. It's just, you know, nonsense personality stuff.